Hello. Happy Birdathon. Hey, Lishka. <laughs> Yay. Happy I have non birds with me. Oh, <laughs> you've got mammals. Mammals are, are part of the Martha Grand Challenge. So <laughs> let's record them. <laughs> so I'm here at our, our uh, Petaluma headquarters. Schollenberger Marsh is behind me. If I kind of move out of the frame, you can sort of see that behind there. Got my scope set up. And we are kicking off Birdathon today with some birding and some Q&A, some general Q&A about Point Blue's Rich Stalkop Birdathon. Um, so yeah, we're we're kicking off the birdathon. We're we're gonna bird this morning together, um, and we have two other Point Blue staff members here with us helping us to kick things off. We've got Kate Schroeder and Deborah Stein, and they both work in our uh, fundraising and our events and our innovation realms and communications. So we all work together to promote the work that Point Blue does. And Deborah is our main Birdathon coordinator this year. Um, and Kate's been doing a lot of support for Birdathon as well. So lots of knowledge here. Um, so yeah, just for an overall kind of um, summary of Point Blue's Birdathon, um, this is our, uh, our largest and funnest annual fundraiser. Um, to support the conservation work that we do across all of our programs. And it's um, it's a really great way to kind of uh, be part of conservation, get out into nature, um, learn birds, and use birding skills you might have to help support conservation work. So um, our birdathon happens in the fall, which is about to, we're, we're coming up on the equinox here, so we're almost in fall. Um, and so that's during the fall migration, which is a really exciting time um, for birds. So we've got resident birds hanging out, but we also have migrating birds coming through, neither going north or south for the winter. Um, so our birdathon happens between September 15th and uh, October 15th. So people have a month to choose a 24 hour period to bird their hearts out and get people to sponsor them at a flat donation or per species um, donation rate. And you can bird individually or you can bird with a team. A lot of folks team up with people and then they choose kind of a birding route or you can also just bird in one place like we're gonna do this morning. Um, we can we can choose one place to have a big sit, or we can kind of choose a place where we might find a lot of different species. Um, and we can also, since the pandemic, we've kind of gone virtual and hybrid in a lot of ways. So you could also team up with people around the world and choose a 24 hour period that you're all birding together in different time zones. Um, so that's kind of an exciting idea. Um, it's fun to have a birding buddy no matter where you are, so you can kind of, um, you know, confirm with each other what you saw or heard um, and just kind of have fun together and more eyes and ears is always better to find more species. And so this morning I'm not only hosting a general Q&A about our birdathon and how you can get involved, um, we're also just going to bird together and I'm here to answer bird questions and I'm going to kind of pause here and there and just look through my scope and through my binoculars and see what's out at Schollenberger Marsh here at Petaluma's um, head, or Point Blues Petaluma headquarters. Um, so, so yeah, it should be a fun morning. Um, back to Point Blues Birdathon for a second before we pause and bird for a little bit. Um, if you want to get involved and you haven't been involved already, all you need to do is go to pointblue.org slash birdathon and that'll take you to our Birdathon portal. Um, and you'll find out all sorts of information about this year's Birdathon, which is our 45th, pretty crazy. We've been doing this for 45 years. Um, and it will show you how to sign up as an individual, how to create a team, how to join a team, how to donate to a team. Um, so if you have any problems with that, you can reach out to Deborah Stein or uh, me. You can, you can email Deborah at dstein at pointblue.org or you can kind of reach out to the team at info at pointblue.org. 
Um, so yeah, let's pause and do a little birding and then we'll get back to some, some birdathon highlights. Um, if you want, I've got um, some birding equipment here, but you don't even really need special equipment. You can just use the naked eye and your ears too. So I'm gonna just take a, take a look to the scope here and see what's out here. Um, I do have, I do have a list here as well that I'll be taking our birdathon bird list today, virtual vultures bird list. I've got two very common ones to add when you're ready, Lishka. Okay, great. Let me just take a look here to see what's out of Schollenberger real quick. I'm going to look into what you guys have too. Oh, I just heard a bird. I think I need to raise this up a little bit. Four bird fall out there. Chickadee, chestnut back chickadee, I just heard. See what duck is out here in the water. Who are you, duck? I just heard it in this hummingbird. Oh, that looks like a female gadwall out there in the big pond at Schollenberger. That's cool. Oh, I just saw a California scrub jay. All right. Time to pause and add to our list here. <laughs> Just move my laptop awkwardly here. All right, so Kate, okay, let's start with your bird. What did I you have do? American crows, very exciting. Awesome. Oh, you took mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then I think you might've said you had an Anna's hummingbird. I've got a couple in my backyard right now. And then I have a bunch of other things that I can hear, but I don't know what they are, so maybe Maybe I can try to figure out how to use my Merlin app to learn what they are. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, the Merlin app is a really great resource if you're a beginning birder. Um, will help you visually and auditorily. So um, also, if you can describe what you're hearing and if you can. I don't know if I'm brave enough to uh, imitate the birds on <laughs> recording. <laughs> I know that's a tough one. Yeah. I would do it live and sound ridiculous, but maybe not for uh, eternal recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to record the California scrub jay, which is somewhat of a recent um, name change. It was uh, um, Western scrub jay. Is that right? Western scrub jay. Yeah. My brain's already forgetting what the old name was. Scrub jay. And we have chest nut bat. Chickadee. And we have, oh yeah, the gadwall out in the water. Could you talk a little bit more about gadwalls? I don't know anything about them. Yeah. Um I can. So <laughs> um I so they, I, gadwalls, I don't know a whole lot about their ecology, so we can actually look their profile up. I don't know a lot of in-depth information about their ecology per se, so we can look them up on um, All About Birds and kind of um, check them out in a little bit more depth. But in general, um, you know, they're part of the duck family and the general ecology of ducks is that in our area in California, um, they're around in the winter and then they go up to the tundra to nest. Um, so they kind of go, uh, they're north for the spring, summer, and they're here for the fall and winter. So that's kind of interesting. Um, we can kind of dig in and see what the gadwall's exact ecology is and migration path is. Um, but they're one of my favorite ducks to see out in the field because, um, their feather patterning is so intricate. When you look at them through a spotting scope, which I highly recommend if you're out on a bird walk, you have a scope, if you're with someone with a spotting scope, look at them up close because they have the most intricate, intricate detailed feather patterning. Um, they're sort of around the size of a mallard, which is kind of the common duck with a green head that we see in a lot of different places. They might be slightly bigger. Um, their heads are a little bit more round they kind of look more plain from a distance but like I said when you look at them up close through a spotting scope they've got really intricate detailed patterning on their feathers 
Um, and like most ducks, the males and females, um, they look different, so they're sexually dimorphic. Um, so the females will have a little bit more of a plain pattern, and the males will have a little bit more fancy patterning going on on them on their on their bodies. Um, they're also a dabbling duck. So there's diving ducks and dabbling ducks. Diving ducks have their feet towards the back of their bodies so they can kind of use them to propel themselves down into the water because they dive deeper to find their food. And dabbling ducks have their feet and legs in the middle of their body. So they just kind of flip over so you can see their butts sticking out of the water and they're just sort of finding things kind of at that water depth. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah. Did you have any particular questions about that? I never even heard of gadwalls before, so that's all super interesting, and I'll I'll look them up later. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna go to all about birds, and I'm gonna look up the gadwall so we can learn a little bit together. Um, there's little bits of information that stick in my mind, and then lots of bits that don't that I still have to refer to <laughs> um, different resources to learn more about this bird. Um, overview. Okay, so I'm going um, to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to learn a little bit about the gadwall together. Can you guys see the gadwall now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this is a male here. So you can see it looks sort of plain, but um, as you look closer, there's just so many intricate little kind of scalloping details on the feather, on the feathers. Um, and then the females, they still um, they still have some some cool stuff going on in, on their feathers, more um, detailed scalloping on the chest, um, not quite as much as the male feathers, um, but they have a slightly different sort of look than um, a female mallard, but you might confuse them. <laughs> um, yeah, you can see the, the legs in the middle of the body so they can walk on land a little bit easier. Um, and let's look here. Okay, so they're actually in a lot of California, they're here year round, um, but there are some um, populations that migrate. Um, south to north so winter in that blue region at the non-breeding is winter time in the blue and then as you go north um, yellow is the migration path and then the more kind of orange color is breeding so they'll looks like they'll breed interior u.s and then also up in the tundra with those other ducks and shorebirds so that's cool a lot of times on All About Birds, this is a really great site to go to, to learn about different species of birds. This is managed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, in their overview profile, they'll have cool facts, which is also um, really fun to go to. So let's learn one cool fact about the gadwall. Um, sometimes they steal food from Amer American coots and from other ducks. Oh, they look so elegant and... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, put together, but they're sneaky thieves. <laughs> so that was that was fun to learn about that gadwall. All right, um, but this might be a good time to pause and just share that we do have a special challenge this year with um, the 45th annual Vertathon. Um, we have the Marsha Grand Challenge. Marsha Grand has been an amazing supporter of Point Blue's work over the years. And um, she loves the Birdathon. She always likes to kind of support teams each year. Um, and this year she has a special challenge that's um, in honor of Rich Stahl Cup, which our Birdathon's named after. Um, Rich was a master naturalizer and he liked to learn about all the different species he saw out there, not just birds. So this year, Marsha is challenging each team to identify one species from the reptile group one species from the amphibian group and one species from the mammal group during your birdathon. And if you identify one species from each of those groups, you get an extra 50 bucks from Marsha Grand. So that's for your awesome. team. For your You're team. Gonna... Okay, for your team. Nice clarification, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so where could we find 
reptiles and amphibians. I can, I can go in my front yard to see it's a little bit early and cold for reptiles, but we have a lot of lizards in my yard when it's sunnier out. So I can go look around. I'm pretty sure I have no amphibians. <laughs> no amphibians. Okay. <laughs> pretty sure. But you never know. I, I got home last night. It's still, it's pretty dry. I live in far West Petaluma and it feels pretty dry. We haven't had any rain, um, but I got home and guess who was hopping along on my front porch? A Pacific tree frog. Oh, nice. Yeah. We do. Yeah, we do have frogs in our neighborhood that I can hear by sound, but I've never can find them. Oh, I've got an in a hummingbird right up next to me at our feeder. Oh, nice. I'm watching it drink. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, so a really common reptile that you can see on lots of fences and lots of different surfaces <laughs> is the Western fence lizard. Um, and so this birdathon, it's a good idea to have your phone with the iNaturalist or Seek app loaded onto it. Um, the Seek app is something that you can use to um, point, you can point your camera at a species, any species, any taxa, and it will use all sorts of computer, um, probably AI technology to, um, to find what species you're looking at to the best of its ability. And that's all based on crowdsourced data, um, iNaturalist I data, all these photos that folks have uploaded over the years. Um, you can also bring good old fashioned paper field guides out there with you. <laughs> I've got um, a guide to the Western reptiles at home, which I'll probably throw in my backpack for our um, fledglings birdathon team. Um, so yeah, bring your extra field guides for mammals and reptiles and amphibians during this birdathon. Um, or whatever apps you like to use, um, or an expert friend. That's always a great thing, a resource to bring along with you. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's see what else do we have out here at the marsh. I'm going to try to get a better, another video. Do you have any, do you have any um, advice on using the Merlin app for sound? I just tried to do it and two things happened. One, as soon as I tried to start recording, of course, all the birds that were making noise went totally quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, there was so much bird song and now there's none. Um, and then I think it just being in a neighborhood, it was too loud. So like mm -hmm. it was saying there's too much background noise. So I don't know if you've got any tips for people who are um, newbies like me who want to try to use it, but don't know how to use it effectively. Sure. I'm, I'm actually pretty new to the Merlin app as well. I actually, I used it traveling recently. I was, um, I went up for a trip to the Spanish Pyrenees. And mm -hmm. that is not my birding home range. So I, I broke out that app and I found it really useful. Um, so in my experience, um, you have to be patient, just like you have to be without an app. <laughs> so um, the bird will probably start singing again that you wanted to hear. Maybe it won't, but likely it'll start singing again. So find that spot where you heard it and maybe dedicate a good five minutes to, to sitting there. Um, and then when the, when the app records the sound, it's pretty slick. So it, it, it will detect multiple species and then the line where that sound is, um, it kind of like comes up in a stack in your visual view on that app. Um, and the bird that's currently singing is highlighted. So it's it's pretty slick in the way that it shows you what is singing. So um, it should be pretty useful. Just kind of keep it open for um, a decent amount of time and kind of watch how the sounds come up and see which ones are highlighted. And that should help detect um, which bird is which. And then you can actually go back to All About Birds look up those species and on the All About Birds profiles, there are sounds. So you can um, double check and see if that's the sound that you heard. Um, <laughs> a little bit about, um, ooh, I hear oak tit mouse out there. It's a rasp bee call. I'll add that to our list in just a second here. Um, the fall and winter are an okay time to um, like play bird sounds out loud. Um, but the spring and summer are not the greatest times to do that out in the wild. 
because birds sing in order to set up and defend territories. And it's usually the male bird that's singing and does that. So when you add a sound of a bird singing out into the wild during a time when birds are using their song to um, aggressively defend and set up territories, you're kind of messing with their system. So it's best to use headphones in the field in the spring and summer or listen to those sounds when you're back out, you know, inside or in your car or something like that versus out in the wild to reduce disturbance to the to the environment. It's not as much of a disturbance in the fall or winter because the the songs aren't being used as much. You won't really hear as much singing, hardly at all, actually in the fall and the winter. So well, fun fact there for you, a little bit of tips on how to reduce your disturbance when you're out in the wild. Um, I'm going to add this oak titmouse to our list here. Um, as you go along um, on your team count, it is nice to um, kind of record when and where you saw your species. That can be part of your learning process. Um, and it can be educational and fun to see for your supporters as well. Um, so when you have your notebook out there, or maybe some people do it digitally. I haven't seen that many people record digitally. I, I think most people like a pen and paper. It's a little bit simpler out in the field. But um, yeah, species um, around maybe what time you detect it, and then the location you could even make some notes about habitat, like if you saw it on the ground, in a bush, in a tree, in the water, in the air, um, that can help with your own and your supporters' educational um, experience. Oh, I see a, a white bird out there in the marsh. We're gonna go see who it is. Oh, that's a young swan, kind of brownish still. So we can add that one. Oh, and I do see an egret out there, a snowy egret. Oh, and a great egret. Oh, three great egrets. Cool. Ooh, and there, I got an American crow too on the light post out here. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're birding by a body of water or an open field, you might see egrets if you're birding in California, in the, yeah, in all of California. Um, so fun uh, distinctions between the white egrets. Um, we've got snowy, which is smaller, and it's got a black beak, black legs, and yellow feet. Um, and then we've got a great egret, which is close to twice the size of a snowy egret and it's got a yellow beak and it's got black legs. Um, so paying attention to beak color and leg color is pretty important when you're trying to, to distinguish between different species, especially when they look pretty similar. So we have both of those out here at Schollenberger today. Great egret, snowy, Egret. You know what? We haven't gotten our signature bird yet today, this morning. It, has anybody seen a vulture yet? No. <laughs> I better keep my eye up. But they, but they do usually hang out around here, so I'm keeping they, my eyes peeled. Yeah, <laughs> we can see them in lots of places. I was so confused, Lisa, because I thought you were talking about the birdathon mascot, and I was like, <laughs> "You're oh. thinking we're going to see a solid owl?" I wish. Wow. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to be kind of on a forest edge mm -hmm. if you want to see our birdathon mascot, which is the northern sawwet owl. Yeah, um, and you'll probably have to be around out at night. And you're most likely to hear that bird versus see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that'd be kind of fun. We'll, we can get, hop back over to All About Birds and check out our mascot bird and um, play the sound of that bird. Um, oh, okay. I just successfully used, uh, maybe you already got it, but um, I decided to plug in this recording because I was like, maybe that the noise of the Zoom is 
uh, driving all the birds away. Um, and so I did a recording just now and it says one of the birds I was hearing was a house finch. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I've got that. Great. And I'll see if I can get more, more of the songs soon. Great. Um, so in addition to the app, so I, I did about uh, three years of field work um, out there. I banded birds. I did point counts, which is just going to certain GPS points and counting all the birds that you see and hear in a certain radius around you. I've done area searches, which is kind of a moving count. Um, and when I was learning to do that, detecting birds by sound, which is kind of like the biggest way that you detect birds when you're doing point counts and area searches. Um, I had to chase those birds down. So <laughs> <laughs> that's something that you should do when you're first learning birds is if you hear a bird, get your binoculars or your naked eye and um, follow that sound and try to see if you can see the bird making the sound and where it's making it. Um, that goes a long way to kind of cement what the sound with the visual. Um, and it's kind of a fun challenge. It can be frustrating, but it's also a fun challenge. Um, and some birds like, um, over time, I've been stumped by an oak titmouse several times because they have a very um, surprising uh, sound repertoire. So they have their kind of basic call and song, but then the, sometimes they make weird sounds. And um, I think ecologists, they're still trying to figure out what sounds are for what. We know that calls, which are kind of like the simple uh, one to two note sounds, those are usually like contact calls between a parent and a nestling, or they're uh, maybe an alarm call that are predators around, or maybe it's um, communication between a, a flock of birds or between a pair of birds who are nesting. Um, and then we know that song is, is the more complicated, complex, um, melodic sound. And uh, for the most part, that's used by males to set up and defend territories um, in songbirds. So, um, but then there's these other weird calls that birds make that um, sometimes we don't know why they're making that particular sound. So still, still more to learn, um, but it, it is fun to kind of chase down birds out there and um, see the visual of who's making that sound and then um, kind of recording where you're seeing them. So that's a great learning process. Oh, a, a vulture just landed on a tree. <gasps> Yay! <Yeah. laughs> Have our <laughs> non-virtual vulture. Awesome. <laughs> Number 11, turkey vulture. <laughs> and that's really the only vulture. What? Turkey, turkey. Nope. Turkey vulture. <laughs> It's hard to talk and write at the same time. <laughs> Turkey vulture. Um, yeah, that's really the only vulture that we have in most of California. We also have a huge vulture-like bird that we can find in a couple places that's coming back from near extinction, the California con condor. That's another kind of big vulture-like bird that um, is one of our decomposers, they like to eat rotting dead things, which is lovely because they help take care of rotting dead things around. If we didn't have birds and animals like vultures, we'd it'd be a, a much stinkier world. <laughs> so. All right. Okay. Um, time really is flying. It's already 9.10. We've got 20 minutes left of our birding and Q&A hour. Um, so I wanted to um, just give you um, a short demo of a couple things. Um, one thing is how to get to our, um, our Birdathon, Birdathon website and um, what to do when you get there. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Hopefully you can see that. Nice colorful background there. I always love these Google highlights. Ah, I'm going to have to learn who Luisa Moreno is later on today. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to get that out of the way. So I'm going to go to www.pointblue.org slash birdathon. Bam. 
And I get to our 2023 Ridge Spell Cup Birdathon with that amazing, apparently this is a juvenile Northern Sawa owl. Um, I think it was Chris McCready that took this photograph. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, so he is currently on our science advisory, or he's a research, what is he? He's a research associate, but he was doing a lot of our um, work in the desert ecosystems at Point Blue for many, many years. So uh, we appreciate Chris for sharing that photograph with us. Um, so yeah, we've raised a nice amount of funds so far. Thank you everybody who has helped raise those funds. So our goal this year is to raise $85,000 for supporting our conservation science work. Um, so far we've, uh, we're getting close to 18,000, which is really exciting. Um, so here, when you first get to the site, you'll see um, kind of the overview of this year's Birdathon. Um, so you can see that we've outlined the Marsha Grand Challenge. Um, and we also are dedicating this year's Birdathon to Ivan Samuels in honor of his leadership and passion for nature and birds and his many years of support. Um, so thank you, Ivan. We really appreciate you being part of an integral part of our community. Um, and then as you scroll down, um, you'll see different ways, uh, kind of explanations on how you can participate. So as a team member or as a supporter. Um, and uh, you'll have that contact information for Deborah. Thanks, Deborah, for being there for everybody. Um, and we have right now, um, we just put up a, a, a FAQ for folks. So if you click on that, it's going to take you to a Point Blue um, page where there's some commonly asked questions. So that's a great resource that we just put up. Um, we also have a merch store, and I'm actually wearing um, last year's uh, Birdathon merch. This is the 44th annual with a marble godwit that was drawn by one of our artistic staff members, Jesse Dittmore. But this year we have another um, original art piece that was created by our um, first ever science illustration intern, Maya Amix. And she did a beautiful sketch of a northern Sawa owl. Um, and we've put that owl onto um, t shirts, sweatshirts, a mug. And then she also did a, a fun kind of kid-friendly drawing of the Sawa owl with um, binoculars looking up at the sky there. So um, you'll find these, uh, these pieces of merch down here. And um, as you can see down here, we've got five styles of kids' t-shirts and sweatshirts, um, only one style and one color of mug. So that one's pretty straightforward, but there's nine styles of tops for adults. So go ahead and... Um, dig in there and see which style you, most excites you. And it's gonna probably take a week, week and a half for that piece of merch to get to you. So um, I would say order sooner than later if you would like to wear that um, piece of merchandise on your account. Mine's coming on Monday. I'm super excited. It didn't come in time for today, but um, it'll come in time for our, our fledglings count, which I'll talk about in just a second. Okay, so back to our Birdathon page. As you and just for anybody wondering, um, all proceeds above base cost, if you purchase one of those, they go to support Point Blue. Thank you for calling that out, Kate. Yes. Um, so yeah, as you scroll down, you'll see um, a list of participants or teams. Um, so if you're coming here to support a team or an individual, um, you can expand this list by saying see all. So if I expand and see all, then I can scroll down um and vertebrates that's a new one very cool <laughs> that's really cute uh, we got the fledglings there the rough wings cool name so all sorts of cool names for these um for these birds uh we've got renegades the peeps um all right we've got west maroon naturalist hour so i love that i'm going to open up this page here just as a demonstration so one of our biologists, Renee Cormier, who is um, also our, our Northern Spotted Owl expert, she was uh, a special guest on KWMR's Naturalist Hour um, recently, and the, the folks that hosted her, the Naturalist Hour host, decided to start their own Birdathon team. So that's really exciting, and we really appreciate that. So if I click on their team name, I come to a place where I can donate now to that team. Um, so I'm going to say donate now, and then I come to a place where I can put in my billing info, and then on the right side, 
you can say make a donation, a flat donation and choose the amount, or you can click this area that says pledge per bird. And then um, you can choose an amount per bird that you want to pledge. Um, and you can kind of type in if you just want to do like a dollar for bird, if you think your you know, team's going to see a couple hundred birds, you might want to think about um, <laughs> how much you pledged per bird, but we welcome you to pledge as much as you'd like per bird. And then you'll see the estimated total come up there in green. Um, and then once your team is finished, then our Birdathon coordinators will follow up with you and charge your card after that team's count. So two ways to donate, um, pretty simple here. Uh, we do have two, can I note two other things, Lishka, about that? Yes. Just, yeah. you can also, you can also pledge to pay by check. Um, and anybody, even if you don't make it the pledge on here, you can send a check to Point Blue um, to support your team or to support the Birdathon in general. And then if uh, any international donors are watching, there's a little call out at the bottom that unfortunately this site doesn't take international addresses, but if you go to our regular Point Blue site, um, you can put in your international credit card info there and just let us know it's for Birdathon and we'll make sure it gets added here and supports your team. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. And I think there's information on the landing page about where you can send a check, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that was how to donate to a team. And then if you want to um, to form a team, you're gonna go up top here or in one of these, this green button down here and you're gonna say register. Um, and then you'll kind of see kind of an overview again, uh, more information, register now. And then you'll see um, some more forms to um, start a team, join a team, or participate individually. You'll fill out your information. You'll set a team fundraising goal. You have the opportunity to create a shortcut link, which is really handy when you want to share your page with your um, potential uh, supporters. Um, and then you can start your page off with a donation. Um, you create, it's got my information auto-filled in here for my fledglings walk. Um, but yeah, I got some different information here. Um, and security stuff and waiver down here. So that's pretty simple. Once you've um, created your page, then you can go back in and you can customize the text that's on your page. You can add photographs, which is always really nice to add that personal touch to your, to your page and share why you're doing Birdathon, why you care about supporting conservation, why you care about birds and other um, wildlife and you know addressing climate change, all sorts of different reasons why you might wanna support conservation. Um, your personal connection to Point Blue, different things like that. So that's all that's all really nice to kind of share with your um, supporters via your team page here. Um, okay. All right. All right. Cool. Well, let me see what's happening out here. Oh, I see a shorebird. I don't think. Yeah, I haven't gotten a shorebird on our list yet this morning. So shorebirds are the birds that like to be in shallow water along water's edges. And I'm seeing a black neck stilt, which is a very fancy looking bird. It's got stark black and white on its feathers and bright red legs. Um, and it is a bird that we actually do tend to, to see here year round, but um, I think there's a, a subpopulation that does that kind of um, winter here nest in the tundra kind of um, behavior that a lot of shorebirds and ducks do. Black necked stilt. Woo, number 12. Um, so our bird counting list this morning is going kind of slow, but I would say if you're a beginning birder group, you're probably gonna see, um, maybe between 15 and 30 species um, in your count. Well, if you do a 24 hour count, you'll, you'll do probably between 20 and 30 species. Um, if you use your, your resources, your field guides, your apps, maybe you have someone in your group that's a little bit more experienced. Um, and then the more experienced teams, if you are part of them or you form them um, in a 24 hour period, um, you're probably going to see between 80 and 100 and yeah, 
maybe average middle ground is like between 80 and 100 species in 24 hours. So that's pretty exciting. And then the top teams are usually over 100. Like I think Rich Stallcup's teams, when he was um, leading groups, he always won, of course, because he was hardcore for that 24 hours. He would go out at night in the wee hours and get all the owls. And um, so he, I think his teams were somewhere around 160, which is pretty impressive in a 24 hour period. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that gives you an idea of how many types of bird species you might be able to see in that amount of time. Um, but yeah, it's it's a fun it's a fun journey, and you can decide um, to do some sort of fun theme. So we have a lookers team that is the team that comes out of our Palmer and Field Station, and they've been going for many years, over ten years now, um, and they dress up in fancy kind of ball gowns, sequins, satin, blazers. Um, so they look good, bird hard, <laughs> and oh, they have a really good motto. Dang, I'm forgetting it right now. <laughs> stay focused. Look good, stay focused, bird hard. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can have a fun theme to your birdathon team. Um, and uh, yeah, you can you can get creative with it. There's also the ornocycles that have been going for many years and they bird by bicycle. So you can choose to do sort of like a low carbon footprint. Um, you can do a walking, long distance walking birdathon. We haven't had one of those teams yet. That would be kind of cool. You can do yeah. a fun by horseback. Yeah, I was gonna say we used to have the bird herders. The bird herders, yep. We've, got, we've had that a couple of years, yep. Um, I've done a team on motorcycles, the throttle thrashers. <laughs> so that was pretty fun too. <laughs> so I encourage you to get creative with your team. Um, okay. What else can I share? Oh, let's, um, let's go ahead and check out the, the fledglings sort of on walk, which I'd like to invite anybody who is a little bit insecure about their birding skills to join. This is a team that I've been leading for the last few years for. Um, it's also open to more experienced people, right? Yes. Birding of all levels, welcome, family friendly. We're going to be doing it here at um, starting at Point Blues headquarters on Schollenberger Marsh and then walking to the Ellis Creek water treatment ponds. Um, and then we'll, uh, kind of circle back to the office. So we'll do, we'll do a two mile loop, um, over two hours. And I think we'll see a good group of birds from the upland habitats to the water, more watery habitats. Um, so yep. If you go to pointblue.org slash events, you will see, um, more information about that. Um, and to join that team, you just, you go to that same Birdathon page and you sign up as a fledgling. So you just join the fledglings team um, and then you you can be part of that that count. Um, just- Lisa, if there's people, we, we have had some questions about people not wanting to register. So if somebody wanted to join the fledgling, like that they don't wanna um, go through the registration process, if somebody wanted to join one of our public walks like that one, but they don't wanna register, what should they do? get in touch with Deborah, get in touch with you. They should, uh, I'll, I'll add information about that to the event posting on the website. Um, and yeah, I think getting in touch with Deborah sounds good. So we'll add that information and um, yeah, then Deborah can kind of make a list and then you can just, yeah, you can just choose to participate as you wish. Thanks for letting me know that because it did mm -hmm. seem like maybe that was a barrier for participation. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's visit, um, let's visit the Northern Sawwet Owl, our mascot bird. Lishka, then... can I ask you one more identification question? Of course. Okay, so I keep seeing birds in the sky, um, but because it's so cloudy, I can't, like, I have no idea what color any of them are. And so are there good resources for using their shape and their flight, like their pattern of flying to help me figure out what they are as somebody yeah. who doesn't really know anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, you would have to be with someone to describe to help you kind of um, pick those things out or use a, often they have flight pattern descriptions in a field guide, um, either online or in a book. Um, so yeah, the different behaviors to pay attention to in terms of flight is um, how often the bird is, how often is the bird flapping its wings? So is it a fast flap? Um, is it rhythmic? Is it just soaring? So that's something to pay attention to. Um, like that, the wing flapping tempo will help you distinguish between different hawk species or species you might think are hawks. So if something is um, soaring up above in the sky um, and not flapping that much in this area in Northern California, um, you're most likely looking at a turkey vulture or a red-tailed hawk. Um, maybe it's a gull. <laughs> um, uh, so a bigger, a bigger um, hawk or a vulture. Um, but if it's flapping its wings fast in between the soaring, you're probably looking more towards a red-shouldered hawk or a cooper's hawk or a sharp-shinned hawk. So just the the way that the bird's flapping its wings, um, how how often it flaps its wings can help get steer you towards um, a bird species. Um, the shape is also really important too. So um, I guess between ravens and crows, that's a common one. If you're seeing just a black silhouette flying above you, um, ravens have a wedge-shaped tail with um, and that's kind of fun to remember because there's a V in the word raven and they are, their tail is kind of V-shaped versus a, a crow's, um, the edge of the tail is more flat. Um, right. I'm pretty sure I've seen some ravens then, so we can add okay. that to our count. Okay. <laughs> Common. I'm, only, I'm only hearing the crows, but I think I'm seeing the ravens. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and then between ravens and crows, um, if you hear sounds coming from those birds. Um, one fun way to remember that's not really that hard to repeat with the sound is ravens say awk, awk, awk. They have a deeper like awk, awk. And then crows say ka, ka, ka. And it's much higher pitched. It's a smaller bird, higher pitched sound. Ravens are a bigger bird and a lower pitch, more guttural sound for one of their calls. So that's a fun thing to remember. Um, Cool, 13 species. Um, and let's let's go take a look at our northern sawwet owl. Um, pretty cute little bird here. Uh, all right, so our overview. It'll take you to sort of a group of photos, but let's take a look at the overview. Pretty cool bird. Let's learn a little bit about where they are. Okay, so they're year round, that purple means year round in a lot of their range, including coastal um, central and Northern California. And then they've got um, wintering range in other parts of the US and it looks like they're not showing the breeding range on this map. So they must, um, those birds that winter up here, they must breed further South. Um, they're cavity nesters. They're going to be eating mammals and associated with uh, forests. So just really great basic information up top there. And let's listen to their sound because this is most likely what you're going to detect if you're out at night owling. Did you hear that? Mm -mm. Did you hear that? Okay. Yeah. I think it's because I'm not sharing my sound. Well, um, I encourage you to go to this site and hit that listen button. It goes boop, 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 boop. So it's a very staccato little kind of whistle. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, thanks for birding with me this morning, Deborah and Kate, and being part of our birdathon info session. Yeah, um, I think that's that's a wrap. Thanks so much for leading us, Lishka. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. See you later. All right. Take care.